Yeah, I'm trying to figure out a game, uh, sit a bit further back. Just because, like, when I'm editing, looking at Matt's face that close up. Yeah, just... I, it's because what I did is I normally watch it, like, in the small editing window. Mm-hmm. I saw, like, one full-size clip on my monitor and went, no. Well, that's the thing, right? It's like, every now and then, you'll just get some dickhead in the comments being like, oh, God, I don't want to see your face on camera. It's, I don't either, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be a voice actor. <laughs> So I'd, I'd love to have just this set up where I'm, I'm like VTubing or something and people are like, yeah, man. You're not racist enough to be a VTuber. Oh, God, no. I guess we could like make little CGI monster puppet versions of ourselves, Carl, couldn't we? Where's this going? Well, you know where this is going, Carl, because I did tell you what we're talking about today, and we are talking about Monsters, Inc. And Monsters, Inc., obviously... The Pixar movies in general are, like, renowned for, you know, just the technical prowess that they were back in the day, at very least. It's to the point where, near enough, every new Pixar movie results in some groundbreaking either AI or animation technology being oh, invented well, slash used. Guessed. Oh, no, speaking of monsters, bring it, get in. <laughs> get, your, get that monster. Just the absolute audacity of that sausage girl. <laughs> just... So... He broke into the office, Yes. ran around behind my green screen for a second, ran back downstairs after breaking out from downstairs, and just... Uh, he didn't even get to appear in the, the video anymore. What was I said? Just make it a meta thing. Do you like um, uh, Mike and Sully chasing Boo around? <laughs> I can just imagine like... you chasing, like, just, like, Oryx and Kane, like, no! Can you tell that we haven't got a new baby gate for the house yet? So all I can picture is that great TikTok of that guy chasing around his sausage dogs with tongs. <laughs> Just <laughs> think I'm gonna get you. <laughs> oh god, like this is what recordings would have been like the entire time if we didn't have a baby gate, but we were like, oh we've moved to a new house, we wanna get like a nicer baby gate that fits in with like, you know, the decor, the vibes. But not just like the cheap metal crappy ones that yeah, but yeah, that has not arrived yet. So it just means the sausages just break loose. It's like oh god. <laughs> Here's a thing as well. Like people might be thinking, well, why have you got a baby gate for dogs? These are Lucas's babies. They are. We were mentioning that like maybe not nowadays because Disney have made them like churn out movies, but at least back in the day, every single new Pixar movie was like pushing the boundaries in terms of what they could do at the time with like computer animation. The thing is they still do. The problem is is that Disney and Pixar are so fucking good at what they do you don't notice it. Like, you know, mm. we talk about Monsters, Inc. today, you'll no doubt get to the fact that they had to invent, like, new hair rendering technology because Sully is covered in hair, and that had never mm-hmm. been done before. And people out there probably don't realise how much of a ball ache it was to animate, animate Sully because it just looks so perfect. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of one of those awful things about animation of that the better a job you do, the less people actually notice it. It's kind of similar to when people moan about the maybe, like... Not littler things, but the less noticeable things in, like, video games and stuff where, like, all of a sudden, if, like, you've got bad camera controls, for example, you don't really notice good camera controls, and that job is just a thankless job when someone does it well, Yep. but dear God, you notice it when it controls poorly, right? Yeah, and that's the thing about, like, Disney and Pixar stuff, where you probably don't notice or realise how much of a ball, like, the technology behind the stuff you're seeing on screen was to Mm realise, or, in some cases, invent. Another one is The Incredibles, with their clothing technology, where you just, of course, the clothes move realistically to a person walking around. That's true, but, like, even with The Incredibles, that was essentially... When Brad Bird was, like, pitching it as a Pixar movie, I believe it was, like, yeah, we can't do this. We can't make a film where the main characters are humans because it'll just look too uncanny valley and they had to figure that out. Yep, same thing for like um, uh, like Finding Dory and Finding Nemo. They brought in experts on like um, uh, aquatic wildlife to make the water seem realistic for Elemental. 
they had to bring mm. in um, like experts on like physics and stuff to um, realistically render the physics that would happen if a, hey if a living person was made of fire what would that look like <laughs> and how would it interact with water Here's the one that always I always use as an example of. In Toy Story 4, they needed to put cobwebs around like their mm. environments. And the artists who were modelling them was like, this is a fucking ball lake. So what they did is they invented AI spiders, taught them how to make cobwebs, and then put them <laughs> into their like 3D world. I they invented about that. AI spiders. Those AI spiders are making like more unique artwork than these generated AI yep. bullshit pictures. Yes, yeah, so if people are wondering what wait, AI spiders, essentially they created miniature AI beings that knew how to make webs based on certain parameters, like the area that they're in, or you know the logistics and geometry of the area yeah, they you place like them in. A web algorithm. Yeah, yeah. And then they drop these like little mini AI spiders into like parts of the 3D world they modeled and then let them create webs and then send an artist in after the fact to tidy them up. That's kind of the weird part that we've gotten to over the years with like Disney and Pixar. Toy Story was like pretty famously the first feature length, like fully computer animated film. It wasn't the first film to like utilize that technology. It was the. No. The first film to be entirely like feature length. This is just computer animation wholly. But that was a ball like for quite a while, but now is considered the non artistic way and the cheap, easy yeah. way to do things. And that's one of the things it's like, I think, like, even if I'm not too into Disney movies or Pixar movies anymore, I still mm -hmm. love watching the making ofs because just yeah. the amount of effort that goes into them. Like, another example, like Coco clothing is a huge pain in the ass to render in animation to the point where for like as i said for the incredible they didn't think they could make that film mm -hmm. do you know what else just even more difficult to render clothing onto in human proportions like a skeleton yeah like how to make a skeleton underneath the clothes but then have it interact like it was on a human but also make it look slightly more like exaggerated because it's on a skeleton and make that all work and the issue they ran into is that the skeletons have joints and the clothing fa the fabric that they created the like animated fabric would keep getting caught in the joints mm -hmm. so essentially what they had to create is like skeleton condoms that they put over the model to stop the clothing rig flying into the joints of the skeleton and obviously you'll never notice that and but you would notice it if the, suddenly the skeleton's clothes exploded off their body or sunk into their like rib cage or something that's the thing, right? Like, how many different rib bones have you got that, that all of your clothing could accidentally get attached to when you're singing and dancing and running around? To fix this problem, we implemented a technique known as continuous collision detection, which allows you to robustly detect all of the collisions as a character moves, even if it's moving really fast. No more wedgies. I think it's like video games, isn't it? When you go up to a, a fence in a video game, it's like, can you shoot through that fence? Or is the fence one just big physical object that you can see through with a fence mesh put on top of it? Mm -hmm. And I imagine that fence was dancing. As well, they have not only clothes, like a lot of the clothes in The Incredibles are skin tight clothes, right? Yeah, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no room to hide. There's no room to hide, but it does make the animation a lot easier. Whereas yes. in Coco, when you've got like the big flowy dresses that they're spinning around in and stuff. And again, they did it just to prove that they could. And every time mm. Pixar does something like this, every other studio on Earth like just puts their head in their hands and like, so now this is the standard, right? Because if we don't do this, people are going to think we're shit. A apologies, my dogs are kicking off in the background. Nah, it's fine. I'll try and like, get just... as much out of the audio as I can. No, when they bark, just put in a clip of boo. There's too much barking. There'd be so that's the thing as well, like Boo, um, really in regards to the clothing, that was the test for The Incredibles, of Boo's t-shirt. Uh, right, yeah. Because when they were talking about doing The Incredibles, I think it was Brad Bird pointing out Boo. And, yeah, mm -hmm. but have you any idea how much of our resources went to figuring out one t-shirt on one, <laughs> one human character model? You want to make an entire film full of that. Like, we had yeah. an entire team of people whose only job was animating her shirt. Mm -hmm. 
speaking about Monsters Inc. itself and not yes. just Boom. Monsters Inc., also known as Monsters Incorporated, is a 2001 American animated comedy film produced by Pixar Animation Studios for Walt Disney Pictures. And featuring just a great cast of John Goodman, Billy Crystal, Steve Buscemi, James Coburn, Mary Gibbs, and Jennifer Tilly. It's as well, John Goodman, man. Like, what fantastic casting for Sully. Mm -hmm. Of John Goodman, one of, like, the greatest, like, living actors... Who just projects and so much warmth. Projects so much warmth, but also just sounds exactly like you imagine a big, giant, fluffy monster would, right? That's, like, the casting for that movie was impeccable. Of like, I cannot imagine anyone but John Goodman being Sully. Likewise, I can't imagine anyone but Billy Crystal being Mike Wazowski. This could destroy the company. The company? Who cares about the company? What about us? That thing is a killing machine! <laughs> Exactly, right? And even Steve Buscemi being Randall, right? Of just I don't actually normally consider Steve Buscemi to be like uh, you know, a sneaky guy, but he plays Randall so well. I think it's the eyes. It's where like there's that great bit in like is it Monsters University where they take off Randall's glasses and he just goes oh, into yeah. Steve Buscemi eyes and it's like, there it is, that's why Steve Buscemi <laughs> got cast. Who's the glasses? They give it away. Huh. Yeah. I love that that was the little retcon that they put in of why does Randall always squint? It's like they just took the glasses off one day and realised, like, oh, man, people like me more without my glasses. It's like, yeah, yeah, I can't you... see for shit, but... <laughs> you squint like an evil person now. He just leaned into it. That was his turning moment, Carl. And that's the thing as well of um, something like Pixar does quite a lot. For example, you mentioned The Incredibles, like the mm -hmm. actress who plays Mrs. Incredible, uh, Elastigirl, mm -hmm. is uh, Holly Hunter, and she, in real life, has like a paralysed nerve in her face, mm. so she like she speaks with like a slight drawl. That's a that's a thing they put onto um, uh, Helen Parr. Mm -hmm. like, they put that feature of the way she speaks onto the model. So that her voice performance mm. would be more realistic yeah. because it just it adds that certain that drawl to the way that she delivers the lines. Of course, I have a secret identity. Can you see me in this at the um, at the at the supermarket? Come on, I would want to go shopping as Elastigirl. You know what I mean? And I, I do appreciate when stuff like that happens in movies. Like I said, the Steve Buscemi things, kid, the squint, the Steve Buscemi squinty eyes. Well, you know when they just make Billy Crystal accurate height, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think John Goodman is a fucking massive dude. That's I, I like to imagine the height difference between Mike and Sully is the height difference between John Goodman and Billy Crystal. And I'm not I'm not, you know, having a go. I'm like pretty short myself. I'm five seven, so it, I'm not actually taking the piss, but No as well. It's like it's exaggerated to a degree, right? And it's the mm -hmm. classic comedy duo act. Do you ever see that thing of for a, a classic comedy duo act you need one orange shaped man and one banana shaped man? <laughs> they, a... they they adhere to the rule. You need one Gary Barlow and one Gary Barlow's son, right? Why is his son so ginormous? The thing is, according to like what the actual height is I'm Gary Barlow's height and you're his son's height, so the height difference isn't actually that much, but I imagine Gary Barlow's like the celebrity 5'7". Oh, so he, he builds himself as six foot. No, no, he builds himself as 5'7". Oh, and he's like 5'5 five, five in real life. <laughs> so I probably imagine, yeah, he's probably like, what, 5'5 five, five or something. Yeah, every celebrity guy builds himself as like three or four inches taller than they are. Tom Cruise is that like six foot three man. That's it. Never forget, like in Mission Impossible, they somehow make Tom Cruise look the same height as Ving Rhames. <laughs> and the height difference between Tom Cruise and Ving Rhames is the height difference between me and you. Robert Downey Jr. is not above it either. Like those shots in the. I can't remember which I Am I movie it is, or maybe all of them, where you can clearly see that his jeans just go way too low and like frayed out at the end because they're just covering his lifts and his shoes. Well, that's the thing. It's really funny because uh, if you go watch <laughs> Iron Man or any movie fe featuring Iron Man, this is a fun thing people can look out for if they do a rewatch of a Marvel movie. You'll notice that you almost never see Tony Stark's feet. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> because in real life, Robert Downey Jr. wears ridiculously large Cuban heels. Mm -hmm. like, f like four to five inch Cuban heels. And then wears giant flares. Which makes it... Do you know what Iron Man when he's talking about I'm wearing a Tom Ford suit? 
And he's mm-hmm. like, so, but then if you go down, he's wearing fucking flares. I don't think Tom <laughs> Ford is making flared suits. <laughs> you know what? Tony Stark's got enough money to make him do that. It's just really funny that you never see his feet because you'd see that he's wearing giant flares that cover his <laughs> ginormous Cuban heels. And the thing is, sorry, it's one thing wearing big heel shoes to make yourself a little bit taller. but then It's the other thing to hide them. To hide them behind the flares. like It it draws attention. It's like the Streisand effect, isn't it? Yeah. Of just If you actually want people to not notice that you wear these ridiculous shoes, maybe don't draw attention to them with giant flared jeans. It's like the YouTube... Well, that's why he has it in his contract, like you're not allowed to film his feet. Mm-hmm. It's like the YouTuber thing, isn't it? So the YouTuber equivalent is wearing a bandana. It's like, you're not fooling anyone. <laughs> I know that my hairline's not as like perfect as it used to be, but at least I'm sitting here. I can like show it on camera. Yeah, you're not scared. I'm scared a tiny bit. But anyway, going back to Monsters, Inc. Because yes. we're getting distracted a lot today. Uh, the film was directed by Pete Doctor in his feature directorial debut. And then co-directed by uh, Lee Uncritch and David Silverman. I wasn't aware of that name before. I've not seen that. And produced by Darla K. Anderson from a screenplay by Andrew Stanton and Daniel Gerson. The film centres on two monsters, the hairy James P. Sully Sullivan, played by John Goodman, and his one-eyed partner and best friend, Mike Wazowski who is played by Billy Crystal, who are employed at the titular Energy Producing Factory Monsters, Inc. Morning, Sully. Morning, Ricky. Hey, it's the Selster. See you on the scare floor, buddy. Hey, Marge. Hey, how is jury duty? Morning, Sully. It's actually a fantastic, like, bit of world building mm-hmm. present in that film of monsters in your closet are real and they want you to scream. Yeah. <laughs> and then... The reason why they want you to scream is just because that's how they get energy in their world. It's their that's, power source, right? That's the explanation for why there's creepy monsters in your closet. And all the world building they do as well of like, um, uh, are they matched? <laughs> they psychologically profile children so they can <laughs> just absolutely cripple them emotionally the most effectively. I love those scenes of when they're in the, the scare room, like the practice scare room and stuff, or when they're showing the kids' perspective of what, you know, it's like for when the monsters come in. And just when it's like, oh, I saw something in my cupboard. And then it's like, they glance over and there's just, oh, it's just a jacket swaying in the breeze. Don't yeah, worry but, about it. And the monsters learn how to do that. That classic thing that you do when you think there's a noise or something creeping you out and you glance over and it's like, oh, it was nothing. Yeah. But the monsters are utilising that and trying to fake you out and then they get you. It's when you think about it, like, Randall really would be one of the best scarers mm-hmm. ever if he wasn't such a piece of shit. Because he well, has the best ability of any of them because he can fucking turn invisible. I get for the premise of the plot, they have to make it so, oh, he was actually cheating, but... Why is he not a fantastic scarer? Because he can just go invisible. Well, see, he is. It's just that he's not as good as Sully, because Sully is, like, as cute and adorable as he is. Lucas, now imagine if a fucking bright orange bear walked into your room. Because that's effectively what he is, right? He's the size of a bear. Well, he's definitely not orange. But I'm trying to think of, like, not the colour that he is, but I mean, like, you know, if a brightly primary-coloured wild animal the size of a grizzly bear came into your room. It is that great moment, isn't it, where... Oh, well, a lot of the time, you know, throughout the movie, you see him as, like, oh, goofball John Goodman bumbling around, trying to, like, figure out where Boo is again and getting lost and scared. And then they have that scene where it's like, oh, yeah, Sully, show them how it's done. And Boo just sees how terrifying Sully is. Yeah. But, but sir! Roar! <laughs> You could read into that of like, oh, it's a parental figure. And it's like when you see your parents angry, for example. Mm -hmm. And they see like, you know, when he sees on the monitor, Boo cowering in fear. And you just feel so bad because he doesn't realize what his anger was um, uh, like, you know, doing. So it's like small child. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in terms of just the plot of the movie, it's so 
nice to have that moment at the end where it's like, oh, we figured out that laughing is way more effective and it's such a nice way to round out this kid's movie, right? Yeah, and then, like, you know, you don't have to worry about the universe either because they start with a scream shortage, which I do like when they say, kids today just don't get scared, which is fair. Like, you know, they're all watching TV, they're all, and they have that little montage, don't they, the kids watching mm-hmm. TV. They're not phased by violence or anything scary anymore because their brains have turned to mush by television and video games. I mean, I'm, I don't necessarily agree that, like, you know, well, with the idea of, like, oh, you, you know, TV and video games, they've, like, ruined people's minds. It's like, no, but at the same time, they do naturally desensitize people more than that they would be in the past because we've got more exposure to the ideas of creepy scary things yes it's like uh, that meme isn't it if like if you went back in time and gave like a small victorian child one single dorito <laughs> it would probably ruin <laughs> yeah. their life because they would never taste that much crunch tacular flavor again mm. <laughs> yeah that's true but, like, but the way they say, oh, laughter is ten times more effective than scream, so you know that the universe is okay. You know their energy mm. shortage is over. It's such a cool thing that Pixar do, where it's like just this little nugget of an idea of, like, what if toys came to life? What if the monster in your closet was real? Yep. Just, you know, we talked about the Incredibles. What happened if someone just sued a superhero, and then all of a sudden it's like... Every superhero of the world's like, no, I'm not doing it anymore. But the thing that Disney are really good at is then from that like kernel of a good idea, building a world that feels alive and realistic in like 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. The world of Monsters Inc. feels so fully fleshed out with the small glimpse that you get. And that's one of the things that they have their art department and designers do of. They go out of their way to make the as silly as the world seems, it has to make sense. Mm-hmm. And that's why you'll notice like for something like Zootopia. Zootopia is a fantastic example where just when she's mm-hmm. crossing the road, it's not a detail that's ever drawn attention to, but you'll notice that there are, for example, the light, the crossing lights, there'll be ones at different heights for the different kinds yeah. of animals. And they never draw attention to it, but someone out there thought, well, if this world that we created existed, what would the infrastructure in that world look like? Yeah, and it's the difference between, as I say, you know, a lot of people nowadays would consider a lot of computer animation like cheap and easy. Mm-hmm. And if it's just bland background with the two characters that we need for the scene rendered and nothing else is really thought about that's the difference whereas something like a lot of pixar films and a lot of other movies do as well we're not just saying pixar is that they will have fleshed out scenes and deep background details and stuff like that that you can or can't notice like you know whether you do notice it doesn't really affect the plot or the characters or anything but it just makes that world feel like a world. Yeah. And it's, that's what I said, like when just Mike and Sully are walking to work. And just all mm-hmm. the stuff you see in the background, like all the businesses and stuff, have different size openings for doors. Just the different monsters that are walking down the street that yep. you'll never see those monsters again, or you might see them pop up back in like the restaurant scene, or they might be walking around the back, uh, like, you know, background in the company or whatever, but they're never brought attention to. No. They don't need to be there. And it's more the little things of, it's like, okay, that's a crazy cool looking monster. How would that creature interact with this world? And they'll more often than not show you that. Like I said, Zootopia is a fantastic example Mm -hmm. of like when she goes like the gerbil town and they have like everything's just scaled down for all the gerbils. It's it's great because they thought about it. They thought, okay, if gerbils were real and they walked around, they lived and spoke and worked, what would their infrastructure look like for their world? Mm-hmm. Like for example, it's um, a great just little bit of detail is the sheep. Do you know the sheep who's like um, the mayor's aide? She uses oh, a yes, yeah. she uses a rollerball instead of a, um, a proper mouse because she couldn't get oh, a click. Okay. <laughs> you never draw attention to it, but how would a sheep you interact with a computer? Well, they couldn't mm-hmm. click; so they've got fingers, so she used a rollerball <laughs> on a trackpad. And someone yeah. thought about that. Instead of just giving them a mouse. I'd never noticed that before. You wouldn't know, but someone making the movie went, well, how, as stupid as the question is, how would a sheep interact (laughs) with a computer? Someone thought about it and rendered it. We do have to, of course, talk about the rest of the plot, which essentially revolves around Boo. Boo! And I believe the voice was provided by, you probably have the detail there, it's just one of the members of the crew's, like, kid, right? Cast. Oh, it says Gibbs. It just gives me the, the last name here. Uh, oh, no, Mary Gibbs. Okay, that Mary Gibbs must be the one who played Boo. Yes. 
and they just followed around the studio with a microphone. Mm-hmm. Just making like all the weird little wah, wah, wah noises yeah. and stuff, yeah. And they would like, they had like the full size maquettes of um, Sully and stuff, for example, and her reaction to that is what they used in the film. Mm. And they let her performance inform the animation instead of the other way around. Which, yeah, is, I guess, what you can do when you've got a lot of time and budget on these things, right? When you've got Disney money, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But Boo is a human child who enters the monster world. I can't remember exactly... Do you remember the reasoning why they come up with, like, the idea that children are toxic? I don't think it's ever explained. I don't think it is. I think it is just explained that children are toxic, you're not allowed to touch them. Yeah, and it's more than... I think it's one of those things of the weird nebulous like government agency it's just it's probably better if people don't want to interact with this world because it just it causes too many problems mm-hmm. and they talk about like the abominable snowman and the Loch Ness monster of like they try to interact with humanity it was a bad idea we abandoned them and they, we kicked them out into their world which also gets exactly. great world building the Loch Ness yeah. monster was a monster that was in someone's closet and they they got to they tried to, they, they knew too much and the government sent them to our <laughs> world yeah, and just that moment where he meets the Abominable Snowman, played by John Ratzenberger. Yeah, I was just a monster that fucked around and found out. It's like, oh, that, oh, that's so clever. Abominable! <laughs> Can you believe that? Do I look abominable to you? Hey, why can't they call me the adorable snowman or, or, or the agreeable snowman for crying out loud? But if anyone actually remembers, if there is a reason why, other than maybe the implication of, like, please don't eat these children when you scare them, yeah. just... Let us know in the comments. I can't remember, but it's just that fun little world building thing of like, look, you're not allowed to interact with these children. They're all toxic. You're just there to scare and get back. (laughs) And how bad do you feel for that one monster who keeps getting caught? (laughs) The like orange guy that's just like, oh God, not again. It's more. The best bit is when there's all the shit from like Boo's um, uh, Boo's bedroom, and he puts it in the locker, and he opens up the locker, and it all falls out. Oh god! They just yeah. keep getting that guy. Twenty-three nineteen. We have a twenty-three nineteen. Oh, Speaking of the locker room, that's another detail that I just love, and obviously it's not as much of a background detail, there are all background details in the locker scene, but just mm-hmm. how do we have a locker scene feel different? And it's just, what deodorants do they use? Oh, like wet dog smell. No, they, no, they use odorant. They put odor on. Odorant, yeah, yes. yeah. It's not True. deodorant, it's odorant. But I just love that no. bit where he's like, I've got a hot date tonight, you got any odorants? Like, I've got wet dog or smelly garbage. <laughs> and just, I love as well the fact that like, Speaking of people that keep just getting the rough end of the stick is just Mike's girlfriend. Oh, <laughs> it's the best bit where they're running away from the restaurant. It's like, I'm sure it won't be that bad. And the fucking laser comes down. <laughs> <laughs> right? Just the huge yeah. big laser. And you just see Mike and Sully go, oh. <laughs> well, I don't think that thing could have gone any worse. <laughs> Yeah, I just had to recheck her name. It's Celia. But yeah, just constantly like coming in the next day, like, Mike, you abandoned me on our date. I've been trying to get this date nailed down for like God knows how long. Then the one time we go to like this nice sushi restaurant, you bring along like your friend and his weird niece that's definitely a weird, strange thing going Which on. He brings like the duffel bag, does he, with Boo inside? <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. And then, like, Boo escapes, and it's like, what's going on? The the niece scenes, like, the next bit where they bring her to work, right? And it's just one of my favourite bits of dialogue, because of how naturalistic it sounds, of, oh, it's my daughter's, sister's, cousin's little girl, and just off the cuff. It's not off the cuff, it's probably scripted, but just Mike just goes, yeah, it's bringing an obscure relative to work day. And then just <laughs> but the, the line that always slays me is water news, when he goes, oh, I must have missed the memo. It just it feels so naturally delivered. Mm-hmm. It's just, oh, it's such a perfect line of, oh, I must have missed the memo. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, bring an obscure relative to work day. Hmm, must have missed the memo. And obviously as well, like, recurring character bits, you've got to mention, like, Roz with the, like, mate without me. And I can't do the impression very well, of no course. No one but... can, right? It's just so inimitable. It's like, mate with... I can't do it either, like, mate without me. <laughs> Watching you, Wazowski. Always watching. 
<laughs> it's such a good little recurring gag, but then for it to like pay off of like, oh, she is always watching. She's like the number one agent. <laughs> She's the Amanda Waller of the MonsterVerse. <laughs> like, She's yeah. Monster Amanda Waller. Oh, she is the wall. She is. Yeah, we there got him this is. time. We got him this time, didn't we? I like how he's just not time, bothered. You, didn't, you just refused to make a cameo last time, didn't you? Oh, I guess this is just me for a minute. Now. It's because like, on my camera, the camera I can see is not as good quality, so it's just blending into your jacket. <laughs> yeah, Carl just gets to see like my lower quality webcam feed from up here. Oh, that's the thing as well. Do you think if you put him in a duffel bag, you could sneak him into a sushi restaurant? Oh, yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> Do you want to imagine how wiggly would that duffel bag be? Oh, God, it'd be imagine? so wiggly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it takes them a little while to realise, like, Boo has escaped. It wouldn't take very long for Oryx. He, as you can tell, is a bit of an escape bot. It's just breaking in twice today already. I'll never forget when you told me when you first got him, you lost him, and you opened up your cup and he was inside your wok. <laughs> I just so the fact he got into your cupboard and climbed into your wok and was like licking the oil residue off the inside of your wok. I'm like, god damn it. It's like it's tasty man. <sighs> tell me tell me more about Monsters Inc. now. Well, let's just because we've already been talking about Monsters Inc. or we've been recording for this video for a while. Don't know how much of it we technically talked about Monsters Inc. for, but I just want to talk a little bit about the animation section of Yes, course. because that's always fascinating. Like I know, for example, they brought in an expert on heavy animal locomotion specifically mm. to inform them how to animate Sully's movements. Because they said, oh, okay. again, it's that thing of, well, he's, he's a monster and it's a fictional world. It doesn't matter how he moves. And it's like what Pixar do, which I think what differentiates them from other animation studios is, they said, okay, well, let's imagine that for a, for a moment, that Sully is real. Mm -hmm. He's a real creature that exists. How would he move? And they brought in an expert and they found it fascinating. Okay, this is how we think a creature with Sully's proportion, skeleton, and estimated weight would move. That would be Roger Cram from the University of California at Berkeley, who is, yeah, an expert on the locomotion of heavy mammals. And it says here that because John Goodman has a bear-like quality within his voice, that he would be a great fit for the character, but then at the same time, just because of Sully's sheer mass, they didn't want him to feel like a big, slow, like, sluggish bear character. They wanted to be more, like, akin to, like, you know, a, a former football player. Well, that's what it says, yeah. Oh, is that what they say? Yeah, it does. It says uh, they came to think of Sully as a football player, one whose athleticism enabled him to move quickly in spite of his size. Okay, so that's the, you can tell how much I watch these documentaries and stuff, can't you? Mm. So all this stuff just locked away in my skull. It's great. <laughs> like, even without meaning to you're accidentally referring to the right bit of knowledge there yeah but yeah it's just the idea that well we've got this like big heavy character but we can't animate him in a big heavy slow way so that just won't be interesting to watch it's it like, also no. won't be very funny because mm -hmm. one and of the best bits is like when like boo for example joe only thinks like boo's been crushed and he's like ah like he can move really quickly so like, that's what makes it funny about how exaggerated his movements can now be due to his size. But I love the fact that they, again, throw in just that little scene where they're doing the training in at home, right? And he's like, you know, oh, do like the tiptoes and do the, the push-ups and all that. And it's just, it gives a just that tiny little nod to, well, you might think it's weird that Sully can move this fast, but he trains every day. Ah, feel the burn. Ah. You call yourself a monster? Ah. Scary feet, scary feet, scary feet. Oh, the kids away. Okay, scary feet, scary feet, scary feet, scary feet, scary feet. Kids asleep. <laughs> Twins and a bunk bed. <laughs> Ooh, I thought I had you there. Well, there's like the little bit as well where it's like where Randall briefly takes over in like the scare contest. And it's like you mm. just see like the 14 different um, uh, bottles go through. It's like, oh, slumber pie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's great because like you would have to, as a great scarer, be prepared for those situations and be able to be quick on your feet, right? And that's what they talk about, is it's one of these why he's the best. It's not that he's just the best scary, he has, like, the best wingman in mm -hmm. Mike. Which they explore more in Monsters University, where it's like, Mike's not scary, but mm -hmm. he has, like, an absolute mastery of the, the theory behind scaring. Yeah, if anyone maybe 
hasn't watched Monsters Inc. but is an anime fan, think of him as like the Deku, but like yeah. early Deku, before where he's got, got power no real powers and he's just sitting there writing down researching everyone. Well, it's like one of the best bits of Monsters University is where they get trapped in the human world. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, we can open the door from this side. And he goes, well, how would we do that? Because Sully doesn't understand how it works. And Mike says, well, if we can scare adults, we'd have to create the absolute scariest situation that has ever been seen. Mm-hmm. And that shows like why he is, him and Sully together are basically an unbeatable team. Monsters University is more inconsistent in terms of its writing and quality, I yes. think. Like, I do think Monsters, Inc. is just a more simple, solid movie. But Monsters University does have those, like, really cool payoff moments, like the big scare at the end. Yeah. Of just, well, okay, yeah, I don't really like the bit where it's like, oh, but Mike was always trying to be a scare all along, but I love Mike in that role of proving himself as just this is why he's the best at what he does. Yeah. I think the best part of that movie is just the ending montage, where it shows their journey through Monsters, Inc. Mm-hmm. And like they, they work themselves up. They started literally in the mailroom. Yeah. And I think, if I'm not wrong, they actually finally somehow it's taken them this long. But I'm pretty sure they said they're going to make like a Monsters, Inc. ride on like the door frame bit. Based oh, they, around that, that. I should. That's, that's one of my favourite scenes in the film. Just yeah. the bit where they jump through the door... And they go to Paris and the entire camera shifts around. <laughs> I love that part. So yeah, the, they have got a new Monsters Inc. roller coaster coming in. It's like going to be based on that door scene, apparently. And just maybe it's just like that that's a bit intense or something. I don't know. But I've always thought like, how is that not a ride at Disneyland? Oh, that was weird. It, it's probably because you wouldn't be able to realise it, right? Because imagine like getting your kid to cling to a door. Well, I'm, I'm sure they're not literally going to make people hang off a door frame. But... but you could do so much with that, right? As you go through it, all the different locations and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's probably not like a like Space Mountain. Not Space Mountain. The, whatever the, uh, the virtual one is, like they do for Star Wars. Where they put you inside the thing and it's like it plays us on yeah, a screen. Yeah, true. Like doing uh, the Star Tours thing, but like instead you go in through all the different doors and things. And yeah, I just always thought that was one of the coolest and I think to this day most one of the most creative like set piece endings to any it, like Pixar it. movie. You've nailed it. It's creative. Mm-hmm. Like I said, just the bit where he just jumps through the door and lands in Paris. But well, they're going through all these different locations, and then it's like, oh, make a laugh. And he just does the perfect front flip into Dick Slap. <laughs> Which might be the funniest, or the hardest I've ever laughed watching a Disney movie, where he just does the perfect front flip, lands on his nutsack, and it's like, oh, she didn't see it. <laughs> so, oh, sorry, the hood was down. It's like, oh, okay, oh. All right, I gotta move here. It'll bring down a house. Yep. Oh, sorry, she didn't see that. What? Adding to Sully's lifelike appearance was an intense effort by the technical team to refine the rendering of fur. Other production houses had tackled realistic fur, most notably Rhythm and Hughes in 1993 with the polar bear commercials for Coca-Cola. That was 1993, man. But also, well, that's Coca-Cola money. Uh, true. And well, who's got more money than Coca Cola? Fucking Disney. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe not. I don't know. And then as well, the 1995 film Babe with its talking animal faces. Mm-hmm. But this film required a lot more for just a much larger scale. And they say required. Technically, it's not required, but Pixar wanted to make sure that they're at the forefront of this animation and pushing the technology forward, of course. Realistically, they could have not had that. It's like uh, The Incredibles. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where Mr. Incredible checks his old suit and he put, apparently, the single most difficult thing to animate in that entire film is where Mr. Incredible puts his hand through the hole in his suit. And when that was in the storyboards, the animators were pulling their hair out of, like, cut this scene, we can't do this. Just walk back to Brad Bird, like, what the fuck are you doing And Brad Bird just was telling them, like, well, is it like you can't do it? Is it impossible, or is mm-hmm. it just difficult? 
And he's like, well, it's difficult. Figure it out. And they did. And as I said, it's the single most impressive thing in the entire film. And no one would notice it, right? It just looks so natural. But the point is, is that it does look natural. If it didn't look realistic, you'd notice. And that means mm. the animators did not do their job. It reminds me of a similar moment where it was like, um, we've talked about it before, but The Last of Us Part 2 came out. Yep. And just in camera, in frame, without cuts, I believe, just a character takes their t-shirt off and people who might not know were just like, okay, yeah, she takes the t-shirt off, what? And then you just got like, on social media, every other game developer's like losing their mind. Like, d d really? Okay, sure. How the fuck did you manage this? Because fabric and hair are two of the single most difficult things to render and realise mm. realistically. Because there's, for example, just moving your arm while wearing a t-shirt, there's like a thousand different variables of how the fabric's going to move around your arm and then the musculature underneath your arm interacting with the fabric. And it's like, you don't notice it. It's like, but you said that scene in The Incredibles where they were pulling their hair out. Like, are you fucking kidding us? Mm. Like, no, do it because if it, we'll be the first people to do it. Yes, exactly. And then you can be the first people to say that they uh, put 2,320,413 hairs on Zully. <laughs> this reminds me, please, oh, please if you hell. can find it, put in that clip from Shrek where they accidentally set Donkey's fur to be too long. Oh, <laughs> the, the big fluffy one. The value for his hair was set to be like 1.2 high, so he's just boom. Oh, God. Is that another one as well? It was um, Incredibles 2. This is the one that was like, they wanted to flex even harder, because apparently Violet's hair was such a ball ache to do because she has her hair down. Mm -hmm. And they were right up until the last second the animators were telling them, we don't know how to do this, can we have Violet put her hair back? It's like, no, it's important to a character that she has her hair down. We're not putting it into a ponytail. Yeah, That's the cheap way to do it. The point of that character's hair is that she uses it like a veil to hide, right? Yeah. And right up until the last second, they didn't think they could do it. And then in the second one, they have her with a blow dryer <laughs> on her hair, wearing clothes. And it's like, oh, and again, the animator's like, are you fucking kidding us that you put this in the, <laughs> this in the, and they pulled it off and it looks completely natural. And it took and someone six months to figure that out. That's the thing is like it's a ball like, but I'm sure at the same time like those animators sitting there knowing that they're absolutely flexing on people. Yeah, that you are stunting on everybody else. Mm -hmm. Like you are setting the standard for what is the bare minimum people will expect, and it's photorealism. Yeah, and it's not photorealistic, but another challenge that they had was to make sure that the hair cast shadows on other hairs. Yep. It says here, without self-shadowing, either fur or hair takes on an unrealistic, flat-coloured look. For example, in Toy Story, the hair on Andy, Andy's toddler sister, as seen in the movie's first opening sequence. And that's hair without self-shadowing. And again, you'd never notice this until it's not there. And it just has mm -hmm. this weird, plasticky look. And that's why there's just that weird, kind of uncanny valley effect in the Toy Story movies with the uh, the human characters to begin with is just, they were still figuring this stuff out. But the first fur test allowed Sully to run an obstacle course. It says, results were not satisfactory as such objects caught and stretched out the fur due to an extreme amount of motion. Yep. And then another similar test was also unsuccessful because this time the fur just went through the objects instead. Because think if you got like two million separate fur or hair like models on this character model, every single one mm. of them has to act realistically. And if one of them goes out of step, like two million, like there's literally two million things that could go wrong every mm. time he takes a step. Yes, exactly. And it says they set up an entire simulation department and created a new fur simulation program called FISD, which is short for physics tool. And that's the thing as well, um, because then they own that, and now Disney mm -hmm. has it. I mean, that's one of the reasons why they push the, like the the the, the bleeding edge of what animation yeah. can do, because then they own it. Like they said, they now have proprietary algorithms and software that can render fur and hair, and that could be yeah. used for you know maybe next time you're going to do a dog or a and person. You can see like every single movie where they make that push for like the next leap. They usually 
then using that in subsequent films because they've learned how to do that more easily. Yep. When Sully had to move, his fur automatically reacted to his movements, thus taking the effects of wind and gravity into account as well. And you've got to bear in mind that that sounds easy, but also that means that the wind and gravity is simulated on top of that because if that's not properly simulated, it's not automatically moving right. God, it all sounds so complicated. But the Fitz program was also controlling the movement of Boo's clothes, which provided another breakthrough. The deceptively simple sounding task of animating cloth, as we've been saying, was also a challenge because of the hundreds of creases and wrinkles that occur in clothing when wearers move. And that's the thing with um, her being a toddler as well. She doesn't move in a way that is predictable. Mm-hmm. And also, they had an ill-fitting shirt. It's not something that was you know, form-fitting like in The Incredibles. It was this giant overgrown shirt that she's just wobbling around in. Yeah, it's no wonder they immediately put in that monster costume, right? (laughs) But to solve the problem of the cloth-to-cloth collisions, Michael Cass, Pixar's senior scientist, was joined on Monsters, Inc. by David Baraf and Andrew Witkin, and they developed an algorithm they called Global Interception Analysis to handle the problem. The complexity of the shots in the film, including the elaborate sets such as the door vault, required more computing power to render than any of Pixar's earlier efforts combined. Which at the time in 2001 was only a couple of movies, but still. Still. Also, they've probably um, got a scientist. I think they've got a dude on their staff who's just a fucking scientist with a PhD whose job yeah. is figuring this shit out. That's the thing. It's like, when you're talking about, oh, how did they make like Monsters in this nice kids movie? It's like, Oh, well, let me tell you about global intersectional analysis, kids. The render farm in place for Monsters, Inc. was made up of 3,500 Sun Microsystems processors, compared with the 1,400 for Toy Story 2 and 200 for Toy Story, uh, both built on Sun's own risk-based Spark processor architecture. There's a lot more to be said about this movie, but I did want to get into the animation bit, but we've been going for a long time because... It's crazy. Barely. And yes, we are aware that the the Pixar combined world theory exists. We'll cover it one day. I know that everyone's going to be like, well, you didn't mention the Pixar theory. It's like... I just don't find it interesting. It's, it's I, I do find it interesting, but it's just Easter eggs in movies, right? And yeah. we'll cover it at some point. But It's not hinting at a wider shared world. It is an Easter egg. Mm-hmm. It's like when and Boo hands Sully, the little fish, it's the clownfish, to hints of Finding Nemo. It's not mm-hmm. suggesting that Finding Nemo exists in that world, it's just, we. it's an Easter egg. But then it's interesting when there's Easter eggs across 30 movies that all yep. give little implications of different things and create, like, potential timelines of events and shit. Mm-hmm. That part is the interesting part, but... I know people, if I don't mention it, are going to be like, well, they didn't even mention the Pixar thing. Like, we will cover it, but I think the animation stuff is way more interesting than that. They made AI spiders. <laughs> and if you don't want AI spiders coming into your bedroom tonight and coming out of your cupboard and scaring you, and make sure that you just like, comment, subscribe, all that lovely jazz, and we will see you next time. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>